Uh, good morning. My name is Marty Blank. I'm privileged to be the president of the Institute for Educational Leadership on this, the anniversary year of IEL's 50 years of growing leaders for public education. Uh, 50 years is a long time, um, even for folks who uh, have been around a little bit, a bit. And as I reflect on what the Institute has been doing over these many years, uh, I'm most proud of the fact that we have sustained a focus on leadership and that we've always paid attention to issues of equity and justice in our work. You know, IEL was founded in 1964. Uh, we were part of the new federal, federal efforts that brought the federal government into efforts to improve the lives of disadvantaged children. Uh, we began at the time that President Johnson created the War on Poverty, and the nation first really seriously turned its attention to the challenges of educating all of our children. And while we've made progress over the years, and indeed I do believe that progress comes in slow and steady and grinding steps. In 2014, we seem to face a host of other challenges, uh, a demographic shift in the, in the country that is truly extraordinary. Uh, Jerry Wiest, who you hear from from Montgomery County, uh, sent me to talk to his demographer, who told me that less than 35% of the children who go to the Montgomery County Public Schools are non-Hispanic white students. Even if you take account of the large number of private school students who are going to uh, in Montgomery County, that is an extraordinary shift in the number of children uh, of color and indeed at the same time the number of children of poverty in our country. We've had these enormous demographic shifts. We've had these isolation of public schools from our governmental, other governmental institutions. We've had distancing of people from from public schools in ways that we don't think are productive. We've seen the inability of institutions to work more closely together. And as we thought about our 50th anniversary, we, we wanted to refocus on the challenges of leadership, the challenges of leadership for excellence and the challenges of leadership for equity. And so was birthed the idea of, the, of trying to articulate 10 lessons that come from our experience and to do this symposium where we would bring together people who could focus on three crucial questions that are now driving IEL's work. Um, you'll see on the program these three pillars. And we now talk about our work in the context of those pillars. Our mission is about equipping leaders to work across boundaries because we see the problems in our society as particularly complex and demanding the support and engagement of leaders from multiple sectors. Some of you may have read an article, I would recommend it to all of you, uh, about strategic, strategic philanthropy, which appeared in the Stanford Social Innovations Review uh, about a month ago, in which the authors talked about simple problems and complicated problems and complex problems. And they suggested that getting a good teacher in every classroom was only a complicated problem. Raising student achievement, on the other hand, was a complex problem because it not only involved what happened in the classroom, it, happened, it, it involved all the dimensions of children's lives and how that influenced what goes on. And that has been at the core of IEL's work over the past 50 years and will continue to be at the heart of our work as we go forward. A few thanks to various people. Uh, I want to recognize my... Uh, uh, my predecessors here, um, Mike Ustan is here, who's a former president of the Institute. Mike, would you just uh, be recognized? Uh, Betty Hale, who was my immediate predecessor, uh, could not be here this morning. Uh, and of course, we also want to remember uh, Sam Halpern. Uh, Sam was the president of the Institute from 1974 to 1981. And most of you know him well for his work uh, at the American Youth Policy Forum. Betsy Brand, who's the executive director of AYPF, is here this morning. Thank you, Betsy. Um, we, you know, we, we lost Sam last spring, uh, but we don't want to lose the legacy of his work, particularly his work around the forgotten half. So how many of you in the room have read the forgotten half? That's about a third. So what we have done 
this was one of the most important reports in the late 1980s. Uh, Hillary Clinton was on that commission, if not the co one of the co-chairs, as I recall, with uh, Doc Howe. How many remember Doc Howe? All right. So history is important here, my friends. Um, and all of you should go uh, and look at the forgotten half, because now the forgotten half seems perhaps to be being forgotten again. And so we want to honor Sam. We're going to be honoring Sam on an ongoing basis, jointly with AP AYPF. This first Halpern lecture will occur as part of our Washington Policy Seminar uh, in April. And all of you will be invited. Uh, Hillary Pennington, Vice President for Education uh, at the Ford Foundation, will be the first Halpern lecturer. Uh, I also want to thank our sponsors, uh, American Express. Let me get this list correct so I don't make any mistakes. Uh, I want to thank American Express, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, J.P. Morgan Chase, the Lumina Foundation, the Polk Brothers Foundation, Packard Foundation, uh, Kellogg, the Graustein Memorial Fund, and of course many friends uh, of IEL like, uh, like all of you who are here today for the support that's made these uh, events possible. And I also want to thank the members of our board uh, who have been helpful in conceiving and conceptual this uh, this series of 50th anniversary celebrations. Uh, that committee was led by Buzz Bartlett. Buzz, are you here this morning? Uh, not yet. Buzz Bartlett was on that committee. Lisa Nutter um, is here uh, from Philadelphia, who's a member of our board uh, and was served on that committee, along with uh, Jerry Wiest, who's one of our moderators this morning, and John Merrow, who could not be in, in attendance. Uh, let's see, did I miss an IAL board member in the room? so I don't want to be embarrassed. Thank you. And thanks to all of our board. You know, the board at IEL, led by Decker Anstrom, the former CEO of the Weather Channel, has been a, a really strong part of the efforts of the Institute to not only celebrate 50 years, because that's a nice thing to do, but more importantly, to figure out what the next 50 years looks like. And that's really the challenge that we face going forward. So one more thought before I bring up the first panel. Uh, you know, in, in my own work over the years in thinking about leadership across boundaries, I've always uh, gone back to the work of John Gardner. Um, John Gardner, um, I won't embarrass everybody by asking who knows John Gardner. <laughs> um, but you know, John Gardner was a, uh, a breed of man of, of, of whom there aren't very many left in this, uh, in this town. Uh, we, we used to call people like John Gardner liberal Republicans. Um, he was the secretary of HEW in the Nixon administration. Uh, he was the founder of Common Cause and a man of extraordinary talent. And Gardner talked about how leadership needed to cross boundaries. What he said was, with all these multiple colliding systems we have, leaders don't control the resources they need to get the results they want. Right? So, Robert Gates, the defense secretary, once said, we have to do defense, diplomacy, and development all together if we're going to solve the world's problems. And here at home, as Gardner suggested, we need to figure out how to grow leaders who can work across these institutional boundaries, trying to influence people over whom they have no control. Because really, that decentralization is a characteristic of our society. So I hope you think about that theme as you listen to our panels this morning, which are going to focus on three key questions that are IEL's pillars. How do we grow the leaders we need for, for public education, not just in, but for? How do we more deeply engage families in the work of our public schools and in the education of their children? And how do we re-engage disconnected youth for whom our systems have not done the right job and who face particularly extraordinary challenges. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Jerry Wiest and our first group to come up. And Jerry will lead a conversation about uh, the challenges we face in getting the right leaders uh, in place for public education. Thank you for doing this, Jerry. Thank you, Marty. OK, let's give Marty a big hand, OK? My job's to wake you up this morning. <laughs> and so I've got the panel that can do that. 
And we're going to talk about leaders, leadership, quantity, quality, and many other things. But before I do, uh, look at your uh, brochure and you can see the panel. They've got uh, stellar background. Uh, they're wonderful, great bios. I'm just going to introduce them as my friend. I'm going to start down here with Jose Torres. Jose has been a superintendent for a long time. He's now running a uh, real focus program in math and science for the entire state of Illinois. And before that, he was running the second largest district in Illinois outside of Chicago, U46. So he's got great experience both here in Maryland and in Illinois and now in the math and science field. So we're happy to have him. Uh, next is one of my really, really great superintendents. Mary Ronan is out of Cincinnati. And uh, if you want to talk about engagement, she knows how engagement really works. The collective impact movement started in her neighborhood and she has that, but she has also moved outstanding performance. She's got great uh, in, uh, growth in her uh, number of kids who graduate and I go on and do really good things. So Mary's a very experienced superintendent. Somebody that was a superintendent, but has for years been working with the Panasonic Foundation and a lot of superintendents. So he has a very broad view of not only the role of the superintendent and principal, but also a broad view of what's going on in America with the Panasonic Foundation, Larry Levert. And I hope Larry speaks out because Larry is really, <laughs> yeah, Larry, and if, and if he doesn't, I'm gonna get him to speak out. Because what he has to say is, is, is very pure and very truthful. Andrew Lackman has been working with superintendents in Connecticut for a number of years, but comes from the New York City programs. And if you've ever heard of District 2 uh, in New York, it was a storied place where actually the people took over and run that district and run it to really new heights. And Andrew is a very big part of that and knows and can talk about that both from his experience in working with leaders now, but also from his District 2 experience. You know what people want when they work for an employer? Gallup put that question to millions of people all over the world. Gallup's a great organization just down here on 9th Street. Boiled down to four things. They wanted to work with an employer they could trust. They don't trust their employer, they really don't give it their all. They kind of show up and go home, it's just more of a job. But if they trust, they're going to invest and become engaged. They want stability. They don't like a butterfly with the hiccups. <laughs> they want stability. Those are two big things that I see that we need to talk about today in education. They also want compassion. Do you really understand my work? Do you really understand my work? And then the last, they want hope. If I give you all this work, will it really make a difference? Or is this just going to meaningless task? You see, in my 35 years as superintendent, I never did see anybody that was a child celebrate test day from the state. They celebrated graduation if they were prepared and inspired and ready to go on and learn and kept engaged. Principals, when we do surveys of principals, they want to see those things from their central office and superintendent. When you talk to teachers, probably the number one reason I got from teachers when they moved or wanted to move or wanted to leave over 35 years is their principal. Their principal. They didn't mind working with children who were poor. They didn't mind working in less than desirable buildings. But if they didn't feel like they had a principal, who they could trust and knew and understood, they wanted out of there. So we're gonna talk about quantity and quality of leadership. 
We're going to talk about the demographics. I come from the South, and we can't be fixing to get ready because the demographics are changed in America. And we're just now waking up to it a little bit, but it's been going on a long time. And we can no longer leave children of color off the bus. And we can no longer not have people of color leading schools and leading districts. So we're going to have to do a better job in our pipeline, both in quantity and quality. I'll start out with Andrew. Talk to me a little bit about that. Any one of the things that I've put out there. Well, I think that, thank you, Jerry. Um, I think it's important to recognize that the issues are both on the pipeline in terms of who comes into this profession um, and on the issue of ensuring that the people who are in leadership positions have the skills, the mindset, the talent, um, and the tools to be able to ensure, one, um, that their principals um, are doing what they need to be doing in, in order to improve student achievement and close achievement gaps, and that um, they've created a system and structures and the opportunities for all of the people, uh, uh, both adults and children, need to be in learning settings in, in our school systems. Very good. Mary, you're a practicing superintendent. What kind of pressures do you have? And we're not going to talk about boards today, but I mean, we, you know, we're going to talk about the pressures that you have from the community. How about the technology and all the people who follow you on Twitter and, and all well, of those speaking kind of, of technology, I'm trying to get the microphone. All right, you go. <laughs> so why, why do you think we're having a shortage? And we've talked to uh, state superintendents. We've talked to uh, people who do the screening, the headhunters, there's a shortage. There's a shortage in the pipeline of candidates, especially for quality candidates in quality positions. Yes, Sherry, we certainly have seen that in the Midwest. We definitely have a shortage of candidates. A lot of it's demographics. A lot of your principals are becoming older. Also, there's the state politics. Um, Pension plans were under attack, so a lot of people ran out the door before the changes came in, which really drove uh, principals out. Then the whole pipeline, when you're hit with budget cuts, the first thing, you know, you really can't cut teachers, you cut your assistant principals. So therefore, you're cutting off your supply line, which isn't smart, but that's exactly what happens. Then uh, the principals you have with the accountability system, if you don't improve test scores in three years, as a superintendent, I'm under pressure from the board, we'll get rid of the principal. Well, I notice when I get rid of them, they're scooped up by some other district, and oftentimes I replace them with a principal who has less or fewer skills than the person I took out. But that's really the churn we're experiencing, driven by the accountability system. Very good. You were practicing up until just a few weeks ago, Jose. What do you think about this whole issue? And then talk to me a little bit about uh, how you think we might uh, get a little more diversity in the pipeline. Well, thanks, Jerry. And good morning, everyone. Um, I, uh, I was mindful of uh, John Gardner's quote that he said uh, he, that Jesus came to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And so I, I hope to do a little bit of both for you uh, this morning. I think um, from, um, from a practicing perspective, I, I probably didn't practice hard enough uh, or well enough. Um, but the challenges are very real. And um, part of it is that our, our the goals that people have for our school districts vary from employers who want skilled workers to colleges who want students without remediation who, to community colleges who want kids with remediation so that because they pay money and they don't get credits. And so, you know, that's a policy actual uh, policy directive. Uh, when I went to community college, I probably needed remediation. I was a second language speaker. I failed English and I fa failed mathematics right around here in Prince George's County uh, Community College. Had I been in a remediation course not taking credit, I would have passed the course but not been remediated. When I had to take the course again because I was paying for it, I passed it the second time. So there's some policy implications. Um, the fact is that um, we have to graduate more students and then we've got to create an, um, 
an equal playing uh, platform. So uh, in recruiting uh, Latino uh, uh, um, administrators, we've got to do more than just create an application that is equal to others. They're coming from a different background. They're coming from a behind 50 yards to, before they get to the starting lineup, to the start line. And so we've got to do something different. And equity does not mean equal. And so we've got to be able to create a pipeline that is um, by design different. And so um, an example, when I was in, uh, in U46, we did some parent uh, training. And I actually created a Hispanic Leadership Parent Institute and an African American Parent Leadership Institute. And I had a lot of criticism because what I was doing was I was training Hispanic parents to get involved and engaged, first about information about the district and second around mobilization skills. And the white parents said, well, what about us? Why don't we have a white parent leadership institute? And I said, you're looking at it. The Board of Education is all white. The parents <laughs> uh, leadership, uh, the Citizens Advisory Committee, they're all white. So when they all change, then I'll have a white parent leadership institute. People don't like to hear that. Well said. One of my favorite quotes is, equal treatment is the most unequal treatment you can give. And I think we've got to think about this meaning of equity and do a little bit of differentiation. And people tell me things are getting better, but I don't see any differentiated resources, differentiated class sizes, targeted kind of programs like Jose talk about where you go out and you deliberately find people and train them and bring them up. Jose, what how many uh, school superintendents Latino you, you have an organization? So we have the uh, Association of Latino uh, Administrators and Superintendents. Um, we have, they, they may have, I, I, I don't even know, but I'll tell you in, in Illinois, we have 869 school districts and they have one less, uh, one fewer superintendent. So they, they might be down to two. You know, uh, Larry? Yeah, a, uh, AASA, the American Association of Superintendents Association, uh, uh, in, in 2012 uh, conducted a uh, status check on the superintendency. Uh, they found a couple of things. One, um, a celebrated increase in the number of women, female superintendents uh, over the past uh, decade. Uh, but they also found that out of, out of uh, 1,800 respondents, 2% of the respondents to this survey were African-American and 2% of the survey respondents were Latino out of 1,800 superintendents. But even the data going back to even 1990 right. uh, points to 6% as the high point. And steadily over the last decade, there has been a decrease. And I believe we're around about 4% uh, superintendents of color, male or female. That's right, male or female. African American or Latino. Uh, let's see, what percentage of the kids coming to schools are African American, Latino right oh, yeah. now? What is that now? Is that about, it's going to get over 50% this year? It's over 51%. Yeah, it's over 51%. No, an interesting thing about this question yeah. is that 50% uh, of the African American superintendents are in school districts that have more than 50% children of color. And I, I don't know what that means, but it must mean something. Well, I think it means something, but I'm not sure what it means or what the implications are, but we're gonna have to do better, aren't we? So yes. let's talk about the pipeline. What do you see in the hope in the pipeline? I, uh, you know, as far as programs, as far as targeting, as far as, you know, those kind of things. Anybody got any well, hope? Well, we've tried to grow our own just because in Cincinnati, in the past three and a half years, 30 of our 55 principals retired or left, which is just a huge number. I mean, last year it was only six, but the worst year was 13 left in, in one year. There is no way that you're going to find 13 quality people. So you really do have to look to grow your own. Plus, you know, Cincinnati isn't really an exciting city like D.C. or New York. So you really you don't have people coming from all over the country 
to Cincinnati. So that's why we've been forced to really look at encouraging teachers to go back and get a master's degree in administration. We also have a high school for the teaching professions in the hopes of having some of our students go to college and then come back and work for us because otherwise you aren't going to find those kind of quality candidates you're looking for or the minority candidates that you are looking for. You know, so I want to go back to that previous uh, question uh, issue, uh, Jerry, and that was African Americans and Hispanics sort of pegged into minority majority districts. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it has to do with the pipeline too, uh, in that uh, many of these districts are broken systems with high poverty, dysfunctional systems, and so my first experience is in a highly dysfunctional system. I may not last. And so I don't have opportunities to go to the Howard counties and the Fairfax and the Montgomery counties. I may have an opportunity to go to Baltimore City and DC and some of the more, more challenging districts that, that have huge financial issues. And so it, it does create, uh, when I talk to my, my friends and they're looking at the pipeline, they say, oh, okay, so I, I can be a superintendent in that district but not in that other district. So it does create a pipeline issue as well. You, you, you brought up a very interesting thing. I've uh, had a occasion now to help 23 of the people who came through my former district become superintendents. And I wasn't aware, but there are districts that won't hire African American or Latinos. There's no sign out there that says that, but there's kind of an internal pipeline, isn't there, Jose? that you hear about? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, they won't say it, uh, but I found that with females too. And it doesn't mean that they won't hire, it's just they're less sensitive to that issue because they think they're reflecting the community. And I know that's a pejorative statement, but I'm old enough now I can start saying pejorative statements. You, you really do have to and, and that's what Jose is talking about, be intentional. And that's what Larry is talking about, being intentional. If you want these, you're going to have to differentiate also to go out and get them when they're teachers, if they're growing, you're growing their own, help them through their college. Create cohorts. Bring the university closer to them. Show some understanding. Give them more than just a year's training before you throw them into the fire. Give them good schools that are well to start with, don't put them in your toughest schools, just like you would beginning teachers. Just like you would beginning teachers. Andrew, policy. Well, I, I wanna pick up on, on Mary's notion and, and what you just said about tapping people and bringing them in. So part of that seems to me to be an issue of identifying a different route into the profession. So less focused on classroom and, and institutions of higher education and more focused on actually the real practice of educational leadership by doing, by having people in residencies, by actually making it possible for people to do the work and learn the work the way that lawyers and doctors learn to do the work. Um, Let's go to Larry, go. I, 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 um, I am the I have benefited from programs that have uh, been sensitive to the pipeline. And in fact, two of those programs were are sponsored or anchor programs in the early days of uh, the Institute for Educational Leadership. I, I am a member of the Educational Policy Fellowship Program. 10, 15 years ago, I got into a network that didn't even begin to look like me, and now this network, as a, as a result of purposeful and intentional and deliberate uh, action and recruiting, the diversity, the demographics of the network are slowly changes. I, I came through superintendents prepared. Superintendents prepared targeted people of color to work in urban districts. It was a program that had intent focus on recruiting black people and brown people uh, early in their careers to consider and prepare them for the superintendency. Uh, I, I've worked with Bob Peterkin uh, at Harvard Urban Superintendents Program. 
the USP program. Go online, check it out. Doctoral program, high quality, uh, no alibis, no excuses, no exceptions. Rigorous program. Targeted African American, Latino, men and women. So if there is intentionality around creating the pipeline, we already know more than we need to know to disrupt the pipeline as it exists. Whether or not we change that will depend upon how we feel about the fact that we have not done so thus far. Well said. Mary, I said some statements with regard to uh, females and superintendency, and I think we're gaining some ground there. But for years, when I started a superintendency 35 years ago, weren't many females. Weren't many females. And I can remember in one of my shops, one of the females wanted to be a superintendent. We worked hard to be a superintendent. It was the same kind of thing. Well, you'll fit in this small district that has some problems. And if you notice, we're targeting for urban. I want to target for suburban. I want to target for rural. I want to target for all of these folks. You shouldn't do what Jose is talking about. Take somebody, put them in a new job that is, has huge dysfunctionality to it. So Mary, tell me about the, the hardships of uh, breaking into the female superintendency. Jerry, I can tell you when um, I was an administrator, there weren't even high school principals who were female. That's how long ago I came through the system. So I was a high school assistant principal, but I kind of looked around and thought, shucks, there's only 10 high schools all with male principals. Ooh, but there's 40 elementary schools with female principals. Mm -hmm. So I went the elementary route just because I knew that was the way to get ahead back then. So, and I never imagined myself as superintendent at that time. But um, one of the ways Ohio is actually trying to do a pipeline just because they realize it's an issue. So the governor has put $4 million aside for new leaders for Ohio schools, and they're targeting um, Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati to be political. It's the three big areas in the state. And um, they are looking at recruiting mid-career individuals from, which I thought was kind of interesting, they were looking at maybe even a Board of Education members, Teach for America alumni, a nonprofit, United Way, a Boys and Girls Club executive, in addition to your business executives and your military folks, and that we have to agree in the district to hire these people for an internship, which would really be like an assistant principal, and then they put them through 18 months of coursework out of Ohio State, and in 18 months they have their license. So that's how they're trying to increase the supply of um, principals in, those, in the three big cities in Ohio. These are all good things. They're kind of random acts, though, aren't they? Little here, little there, uh, from people who have uh, good intentions and uh, some resources to do it, because it takes resources. Because if you're going to do the differentiation, you've got to have some resources to differentiate with. Where do people go now? How would you, how would you make this when, you know, how would you make this work? Larry? I, I think we need to look at money. Okay. Um, uh, and, and where uh, priorities are around the preparation of, of new leaders, uh, not, not in the sense of new leaders in schools, but in terms of system, the system of leadership preparation. I, I know a, a, a number of young men, uh, African-American young men primarily, uh, who are young in their careers with families with uh, humongous student loans uh, yeah. that strap them. Um, and uh, these are, several of these young men are, are, are working their way through the system and slowly working their way through student loans. But when it comes to graduate school preparation, that's a, a huge barrier uh, with a, a, a tab of $60,000, $65,000 to get through a two-year doctoral program uh, in educational leadership when you're already saddled. I, I think we have to look at real financial incentives that open the pathway for people to have access to high-quality training that does not require them to uh, choose between them, uh, their education, and, and what their obligations are as, as family men, Excellent, women. excellent. 
One of the things that Mary said I want to go back to, and I want to hear from Andrew, and I want to hear from Mary, and I want to hear from Jose, and I'll start with Mary first. She said, I had no idea I would be a superintendent. How many times have you heard that from teachers who became principals? Somewhere along the way, somebody taps him. Somebody sees that potential. Somebody helps them, mentors them, and moves them up. Is that correct, Mary? Yes. Yeah. And that's what Larry is talking about. He's talking about he knows this group, but they have this barrier. So we've got to have a system that somehow finds the talent, somehow nurtures the talent, and somehow supports the talent over a long enough period of time, and then we can't do like we do beginning teachers, put them in the toughest places. We've got to think about how we intentionally place them. And we're going to have to really work on that because we can't have one or two percent of the leadership population sporting as role models 50 or 60 percent of the student population. So tell me a little about what would we do differently when we get up out of our seat? What could we do differently to make that pipeline work? Jose, you're running a statewide organization now. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to um, be having been selected to be the president of the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy, and um, I would never have thought I would have landed in that sweet spot. It is a really great organization uh, developing STEM talent among the highly gifted in Illinois, and also um, promoting STEM excellence in the state. And I, this is my third week on the in the job, <laughs> and um, hopefully, they'll, well, they'll see the video maybe. But um, in any case, I, it, it, it is not something that you aspired to be because uh, there are no there were no role models there. There are a few a few teachers that are Latino. There's a couple of um, of African American teachers, and that's it. And in fact, I had a conversation with a teacher who just left. Um, she was a chemistry, advanced chemistry teacher at this school, and every time when I met with her, every time she, what she told me was every time people met her, they kept thinking that she was going to teach Spanish. The subtleness of discrimination and bias is everywhere. So I, I, I worked with the National Association of State Boards of Education, and I, I happened to go to some of the circles that many of you go into. And I, was, and I, I would say with, you know, I would find another person of color and say, hey, we're bringing color into this meeting. That's, you know, the fact is that when, when you inhabit the skin that we, and I know, I know, I know, I know who I'm talking to, right? <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about, and that is that you've gotta be better, you've gotta be more prepared, you always have to sort of prove yourself and so there's this sense that you've got to you know, rise up, and often you're the only person. And so the system is getting the results that it's designed to get. The only way to get the different results is to change the system. And that means that we've got to disrupt the power structures that are there. And to do that, you have to have some power and you have to have some money. So all you have to do is look at who's sitting on boards across the nation, who's sitting on CEO suites, and so forth, and that's, that's the system, and they're producing the results that they're, they're getting. And that, that may not give you a line by line, but you know, when you talked about trust, that people want trust, I think I equate trust with passion. And so people wanna be passionate about their work, and they've gotta be able to, you know, and some people will not take the, the, the risk that you need to take to disrupt the system because you may be out of a job. And so you have to have enough confidence to say, you know what, I'm well prepared, and if I'm not wanted here, I will be wanted somewhere else. And so the, the, uh, one, one last story, when I first started as superintendent of my school district in U46, um, I, went into, uh, I was going into many classrooms, and I go into a third grade classroom, and this uh, little girl um, looks up at me and says, you know, the Latina girl, 
She says, who are you? I'm like, I'm the superintendent. And you know, third graders don't know what superintendent means. So. Mm -hmm. I learned that very early on. And I said, you know, I'm the boss. You know who the principal is? I always ask, do you know who the principal is? Just in case. If they didn't know, I knew I needed, I needed to uh, destabilize the system. But um, she said, yes. And I said, well, I'm her boss. And I'm the boss of all the principals. And then she looked up at me and said, I want to be a superintendent. <laughs> So I just want to talk a little bit about Connecticut. Um, so um, there's a program in terms of intentionally finding people, um, giving them a two-month sabbatical at the end of the year before they actually take over a principalship, um, which they use as a community of practice to go visit schools around the country to see places that work so that they know that it can, in fact, uh, happen. Um, and, and basically to use that time to plan for taking over their school. Um, then they go into a program where they are in a monthly community of practice. They have an executive coach who meets with them at least three or four times during the month um, and um, basically is providing support to them to be more reflective practitioners and to be able to lead their school uh, forward and close the achievement gap. Um, and then they um, leave that program after the year um, and continue to get support uh, for their leadership team and their work um, because basically this is an ongoing adult learning that we are trying to foster, not a particular program and not any one, here's your piece of paper, go do it. Very good. Larry? Uh, this, this assumption that we, upon granting an EDD or PhD in ed leadership and or ed administration or field that uh, supposedly prepares one for uh, leadership of, of, of a complex organization titled school district is, is, is arcane. That, that it just makes no sense uh, to graduate a person from school, whatever level, doctorate level, and then believe that that person can run for 20 or 30 years on whatever incident, incidental knowledge he or she seeks to acquire voluntarily. It, it just is dumb. Uh, and well said. <laughs> so, so Andrew and I both have opportunities to work with in-service superintendents in professional learning communities that are organized to support the superintendents, see, and the various challenges that superintendents are exposed to. Uh, while we have, a, a, I in New Jersey have a restricted focus on equity and excellence uh, as the, the purpose and, and theory of action for the New Jersey network of superintendents, which is now in its seventh year, um, and we've had over 31 superintendents involved over those seven years uh, who are in classrooms looking at instruction, talking with each other about instruction, bringing problems of practice, engage in discussions of their theories of actions, uh, working through solutions, being exposed to high-performing superintendents like Mary Ronan, who came there and talked to our districts, uh, Andres Alonzo, Jerry Wiest, uh, and, and had real professional, ongoing learning experiences that are multiple years in duration in a community in which there is high trust, high relationships, and high support. It, it matters what we do to support the superintendent leaders who are in very complex political jobs in which governance structures are out of whack with reality and superintendents do not have the, the power necessarily in their role, or not, not power, authority in their role to do many of the things that uh, uh, are necessary as a cross-boundary leader. Uh, superintendents just don't lead schools. Real superintendents lead communities across the sectors that, in, that touch upon the children and families they serve. 
Very good. Mary? I have to second what Larry said. You know, when you hire 13 principals and you know early on they don't have the skills they need, we actually had to seek out um, professional development programs to really support these individuals. You know, we work with um, University of Virginia, the turnaround program. We work with our local University of Cincinnati to come up with an urban endorsement for our principals because that was really important. We have a professional development arm in our district, the Marison Academy, because without those supports, as Larry said, th these individuals who you, you had to hire because they were the best available, you've got to equip them with the skills so they're successful or you really have defeated the whole purpose. So I have to say PD is just so, so important. We're gonna turn it over to you. I think the panel has done an excellent job trying to outline we need to improve the quantity and we need to be deliberate about that. We need to improve the quality, that means it's support for all leaders, and we need to be more deliberate in how we are going about this because the educational opportunity for our children means the educational opportunity for our country. And when you think about it, our country is dealing with some very complex issues, and we are a small country in a big world. We like to think of our 300 million people being big but there's about seven billion people in the world, and there's a whole lot of problems. And we can't just educate half of the children in the country. We have to educate all of the children because even if we do, that's only 50 some million children trying to help make a world and keep a country strong. In order to do that, they have to have leaders. Leaders have to be well qualified, and we can't be fixing to get ready. We've got to start doing something. IEL has embarked on that. They're talking about this because the pipeline isn't so big. Maybe they need to get back into the leadership training or getting into how to do some more help for that role. Let's turn it over to you. Who's got a question? Yes. How do you uh, increase the pipeline in the school board area? Uh, because that diversity is probably worse than it is in our own superintendent environment. And then who would actually be crazy enough run for a school board? And then how do you prepare them to do that? Anybody want to take that one? As a former school board member? <laughs> yes, go ahead. No. Uh, go governance is like a huge uh, uh, elephant in the room, uh, Greg, um, that uh, needs to be addressed. I mean, uh, superintendent's tenure, uh, we, we're all you know, concerned about how do we create stability, like Jerry said, is one of the things that people want most, uh, for the things that people want most in, in a relationship with an organization, yet we have a governance structure that micromanages, gets in, wants to get involved in patronage, wants to get its hands dirty in all areas of operation where they have absolutely no business. And, you know, as, as we talk about the development of superintendents, we, we also need to think about the development of boards and, and helping them to grow from where they are to where they need to be. And even with that, we will not be able to uh, preclude people entering, uh, seeking election that are uh, single interest candidates or funded by uh, people like the Coach Brothers or, you know, that's not gonna happen. Money, money, money is, just a pervasive evil in this education environment, policy environment at this time. If you got money and big money, you can play. And you can come in and you can play nationally, you can play locally in school board elections, you can play wherever you want. And, and some, something has to be done uh, somewhere to equalize the democratic access that this country is founded upon so that it, it, the outcomes of governance should, be not, should not be driven by the will of those who have wealth. One of, the, one of the things, and I wanna 
you know, is that we have tried different governance structures. We've tried appointing by governors. We've tried the mayoral. We've tried spinning off charters and having their own boards. You know, different states have actually thought about vouchers and actually have done it. In all of the structures, the data is fairly inconclusive about which structure works better. In fact, the data really show that they're all equally <laughs> not as effective as we would like. I'll try to say that positively. What I think I've observed is that where you have, and I want these folks to comment on it, we have an excellent superintendent, somebody that actually does lead the community, a superintendent that actually understands the people who do the work are in the classrooms and support the classrooms, a superintendent that actually actively engages the parents, there's less of a problem with the Board of Education. And that's why I think we need highly trained leaders who know how to run the complex organization. Any feedback on that? Would you say that was true? Mary, you haven't any trouble with your board, so. And Jose? Well, J Jerry, we have all of the above that you mentioned in Ohio. We have mural control of some of the large urban districts. We have charters. I have 40 charters operating within my boundaries. We have vouchers to private and parochial schools, so I have 8,500 8, children in charters, 3,500 on vouchers. Um, Everything has been tried, and I think you're right. I think we're grappling with what is the appropriate structure to really make things uh, work. In fact, at this point, we're actually sponsoring two charter schools to try to regain some of our um, market share, and that's an interesting dynamic between mm -hmm. the elected school board and the board that runs the charter that you have sponsored. So that's an interesting dance among board members. Um, my board members think I'm keeping all the good principals locked up in a room somewhere and I'm only letting the poor ones out because they just don't understand that the, the supply isn't out there and you need money and resources once you hire someone to develop them. And I think that point's missed. They're always looking for that person from somewhere else who's going to come in and turn things around. Well said. Uh, I, one other thing I want to make a comment on, we didn't uh, really start making the kind of progress that we needed to with all the children until we put race on the table. It is something that is not talked about in America, and it's certainly a hot topic to talk about within the context of a complex organization, but you do have to talk about it. You can't just dance around it, and everybody needs a lot of preparation we actually put our principals through a year or a year and a half of preparation about how to deal with it and how to talk about it. And the same thing with our leadership. So that is intentional if you want to get some diversity on boards, you want to get some diversity in your uh, program, you have to be intentional about it just like your hiring is intentional. Just like we spend more time, it seems like, choosing our cars. I noticed in the uh, USA Today little poll this morning than we do choosing our doctors about twice as much time. And so we're very intentional about choosing which car we're gonna drive and all of that kind of stuff, but not intentional on some of the things that really make a difference, like our 401Ks and our, uh, you know, our doctors and things like that. We're gonna to have to get intentional about this diversity business. Jose, you were wanting to say something. I was just gonna say that um, among the areas of preparation that superintendents need is obviously sort of how do, how do you lead a board of education? Uh, and people who are very committed, as I was trying to figure out how do I uh, propose um, two candidates that they should consider running, and I said, look, this, this is the proposal. You get to come on Monday, every other Monday night, and you don't make really key decisions. You don't get to run the district. That's my job. Mm. You get to approve the budget. You get to hire and evaluate the superintendent. You, you get to uh, approve policies, and then you get to sit and hear criticism, and you cannot respond, because if you go respond, that's a trap. And then when you go buy your milk at the grocery store, people will attack you. And for that, in our district and in Illinois, you get no money. So um, how about that? Would you like to run? <laughs> and, and so the people who are there who do run, I mean, they're, they're, they're really getting their wings. 
Uh, they, they really are saints. And some of them are doing it for pure motives, no, no self-interest. Some of them then, of course, have, uh, are, are using it as a stepping stone, but then the, the superintendent has to figure out how do you motivate, how do you lead, how do you stroke the board without spending 50% of your time so that you could actually run the organization as well. Spoken so that, like that a man with confidence, okay? <laughs> he had confidence from the training, but what I'm worried about, if we don't train well, they won't make those statements. He had a clear understanding of roles and responsibilities and worked through that. Other questions now, go. Yes, over here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Vito Borello, Executive Director for the National Association for Family, School, and Community Engagement. Appreciate um, the amount of time that you spend on the importance of professional development around educational leadership and also the importance of intentionalizing the embracement of diversity uh, in that leadership. I'm curious if you could respond to how you have addressed, particularly the two superintendents, how you've addressed um, building capacity around culturally responsive family engagement in your principles. You know, recent research indicates that Generation Y teachers' number one fear uh, for leaving the profession or failing in the profession is their lack of preparation to engage families. It's not really happening at higher education as it needs to, so professional development is essential, and I'm curious if you could respond to that. Thank you. Who would like that one? It's an, you point out an area of uh, significant need. Um, I, I can tell you about work that I've done around connecting the disconnected, uh, in, in developing so culturally responsive approaches to parent engagement, family engagement. Uh, but it's, it, the, the reality is that uh, that work is pretty isolated. Uh, and there is a sy systemic lack of understanding across uh, types of communities, all types of communities, be they rural, urban, or suburban, uh, around the importance of cultural responsiveness uh, in, in both instruction and engaging with our families. That, that is an area, uh, as you know, we don't do well. Uh, and again, there, there's an, an abundance of knowledge, an abundance of research, uh, clear evidence that uh, engaging parents, engaging students uh, in culturally responsive modalities uh, changes the affiliation, right, rate, increases the rate of engagement, and uh, builds a, a, a stronger connection of, and relationship that is necessary to either support change in a community or a school or to support a child's persistence in, in a curriculum and in, in te teaching and learning environment. So I, a lot of work needs to be done in that area. When I look at school districts now, after being out three years and helping other superintendents, when I don't see a community engagement uh, sitting on a cabinet level position or sitting in somebody's area of responsibility or at least being there on your flow chart, then I start looking, what are you doing with parent academies? What are you doing with uh, teaching parents? Poor parents will do the same as rich parents once they learn how to work the system. Rich parents, I've noticed, don't, keep, uh, don't put up with poor teaching. Poor parents, they get angry, but they don't know how to work the system, so you have to teach them how to kick your butt, just like the rich parents do. Once they learn and know how to approach, the fear goes out of the situation, so it's intentional. So one of the ways you can judge your school district is where's the engagement happening and who's in charge of it and how close is it to the superintendent and how intentional is it? Other questions? We had a lot of them. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Lucy Getman, National School Boards Association, and I'm just really glad to see that school boards and local governance are uh, a part of this conversation. And uh, in fact, my boss, Reggie Felton, used to be your boss yes. at Montgomery County School Board. He hired me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I agree that um, how, how school boards function are vital to the success of school districts and communities because, first of all, they so much 
more ref as a as a location of political leadership, they so much better reflect our country in terms of over 40% of local school board members are women, 17% are African American, six or seven percent are Latino, and that's not enough. It's not completely reflective of our country, but certainly it's a lot closer than state legislatures or Congress. And just a little trivia question: Anybody um, have a guess as to what percent of members of Congress were local school board members early? in their career? Four percent. And maybe if we had more local yeah. school district perspective um, in Congress, we would uh, get a little more of what we want from them as well. But um, Question? I, well, my question is, oh, darn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got the advertisement. I like this. Okay. Um, what advice would you give to anybody and everybody in this room um, who maybe wanted to run uh, run a school board campaign knowing that three quarters of those campaigns cost a thousand dollars or less anybody it's a good question go well uh, as my board members used to say um, there are no losers in board member elections because if you lose you actually win <laughs> <laughs> But um, I, think, I think you just have to be clear, uh, understanding the role before you run, and understand that you're not going to be able to run the district. And, uh, and there's really, uh, I think it's a very selfless act. Uh, now, there, I, I understand that there's some boards that get paid, but again, they don't get paid enough for what they would have to put up with. Um, and, I, and again, and I think, uh, what we've been talking about here is, that the way to support local schools is to have strong, effective school board members, unless uh, we change the whole system, because this, that is part of the system. So with well, that, the, uh, I'll leave it to you. One of the ways I think is the best way is to be as transparent as you possibly can, even in large, complex organizations. Embrace whoever runs, bring them in, show them the complexity of the organization, help them understand, open your employees to talk to them, don't just talk to them yourself so they can see different viewpoints on the issue, and get them as much information as they can. I think if they're not coming with a sword, you know, with a single interest issue, which I think is, be, is, is a problem, most of them open up and become very reasonable people. And they have to learn to work together. Now, the single issue people, we're getting more and more of those because as uh, right. what uh, Larry was saying, they're getting endorsed and uh, their campaigns are being paid for. And they're coming on with single notions. So we need to do some more about that. Other questions? Yes. Okay, my question is uh, fitting, I think, given that we're here at the NEA. I'd like to know what role you think unions can play in promoting leadership in education and in promoting diversity. Uh, I'm going to answer my point on that. I think they're vital. If you didn't, if you, I've been in states that had right to work and I've been in states that were highly unionized and on AFT and NEA. That's the people who actually are doing the work in the field. So you have to have some organization to communicate with them. So even when the reunion is not strong, you need a strong association because you can't communicate with everybody all at once. And it's good to have a representative type of an organization. So I've never feared the union, I've embraced the union. Andrew? No, I would just second that. I mean, I think that um, you're closest to teaching and learning, um, and that's where the action is, and it's what makes the most difference. So the union has a clear role in ensuring that the people who are in the profession actually have the skill and knowledge that they need. It needs to make sure that the people who are in the profession who shouldn't be in the profession are not in the profession if they're really going to be professionals. Um, and it needs to have a commitment to ongoing professional learning. I would make one caveat on my statement also. If they're single interest, like a single interest board member, then you have to really put up a fuss. That's not what I'm talking about. If they're only interested in wages and working conditions, then we've got an issue. If they're really interested in professional development and community, then the embrace comes. And even if they're not there, you've got to help them get there because they are the people who absolutely make the difference. The people, it's, we're the only organization in the country that doesn't listen to their employees. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Uh, I just wanted to make sure, I'm asking, do you think the union can play a role in promoting diversity? Do you see administrators being able to work 
to have the union help develop those new leaders? Look, unions are key every which or why across the organization, across the, the, the challenges. U unions need to be at the table as a partner in figuring this out. Um, so the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Definitely, if you're looking to grow your own administrators and you're looking at your teacher leaders, you want your teacher leaders to be a diverse group with the support of your union, so definitely. I would add that just like all of us are looking at who's at the table, we need to look at who's at the table. So who is at the board level at the local union? Do they represent the students? I mean, meaning demographically. And if they're not, how do they promote that leadership in order to increase the diversity within their, their ranks too? So to sum up, and we've got to end, this panel's done a great job. Could you give them a hand? We talked about four things when we kicked off. We've got to bring back trust. We've got to bring back stability, some compassion, and some hope of understanding the work and the complexity of the work. In order to do that, we've got to be more intentional to engage our community and, frankly, to engage our students. We've got to do more than just prepare them. We have to inspire them to go on. And that takes a fully engaged workforce. That doesn't happen by chance, and that's what this panel has pointed out. And they pointed out some things that we can do when we get up out of our seat to be more intentional. And if we do those things, and really do put race on the table, and start talking about diversity and engagement, I think we will start to do a better job of supporting our children in the complex world that they're going to be dealing with when they take over, and that isn't going to be too long. It happens quicker than you think. I think IEL can play a, a big role in that if they choose to, and I think you and your different organizations can too. So let's all work together. Thank you. <laughs>